Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar on infrastructure financing trends in, in Africa. Thank you very much for, for waiting. Uh, we will now start um, the session. So my name is Arno Foris. Uh, I'm a financial sector advisor with the Making Finance War for Africa partnership. And as you can see on, on the screen, today's webinar is an opportunity to discuss the findings of uh, the Infrastructure Consortium for Africa flagship report uh, named the Financing Trends in Africa and uh, the last iteration, the 2018 iteration. And this is an important publication uh, for the financial sector community as it looks at sources of finance uh, for Africa's infrastructure development, highlights the role of the private sector and offers uh, policy recommendations uh, to increase the financing of infrastructure operation on the, the continents. And we, we are quite pleased to welcome you today as we've, we've had over 100 um, confirmations. So the, the, the content of today's session uh, is displayed on, on, on your screen. Um, our esteemed uh, speakers uh, will uh, particularly outline how financing was spread between regions and, and sectors uh, with a focus on, on water and transportation. Uh, they will also explore the different sources of, of financing and identify sector challenges uh, as well as, uh, as investment uh, opportunities. Um, so as you know, today's webinar is, is run by, by Making Finance um, Work for Africa, uh, which is um, which is a G8 initiative hosted uh, by the African Development Bank uh, and whose mission is the establishment of, uh, of a common platform for the harmonization and facilitation of financial sector development and, and knowledge sharing um, in Africa. And the partnership, as you can see on your screen, uh, focuses on, on three interlinked uh, strategic pillars. So from the left to the right, uh, financial inclusion, long-term finance, uh, and financial stability and regulation. Uh, with um, knowledge management serving as a cross-cutting uh, pillar um, across our activities. So you can, so from, from our website, uh, mfw4a.org, you can access thousands of, of articles and publications uh, on financial sector development issues. Uh, as mentioned um, before, we are hosted uh, and partly financed by the African Development Bank, uh, other uh, partners include the, the German Corporation, the, the GIZ, uh, the Agence Française de Développement, uh, also Afrexim Bank, uh, the European Investment Bank, and uh, the Dutch uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, namely Min Minbuza. Um, before we get started, I would like to go over a few uh, housekeeping items, uh, including the, the structure of this, this webinar, as well as uh, important instructions on how to, to participate uh, in, uh, in today's event. Um, so the webinar will last a, a maximum of, of 60 minutes of one hour, including the, the question and answers. Uh, for your comfort, we request all participants to mute um, their, their microphone. Um, questions can be submitted via one of the two panels on the chat or the Q&A tab. And you've got these two tabs on your screen. Otherwise, you can simply um, click on the raise hand icon. Please remember to lower hand uh, and mute your microphone after your, your question. And also feel free, feel free to send a, a message to the organizers for, for any issues. Uh, in case you are experiencing any technical issue, please send a quick request for, for support uh, and our technical team will be uh, more than happy to, to help. And uh, the goal is to have the, the uh, webinar that is um, as interactive as possible. So please feel free to, to, to write questions on the chat uh, as the presentations uh, move forward. So finally, slides uh, and the recording will be um, will be available. Uh, so the slides of the presentation uh, of the presentations and the recording of this webinar will be available from from our website uh, after after we conclude. Um, also, one, one other important aspect, um, please remember to fill out the survey that will appear uh, automatically on your screen after uh, the session. Uh, this survey is very important to us as it helps um, to improve the delivery of our webinars and, and to identify uh, relevant financial sector uh, related topics to, to, to discuss. So, so thank you very much in advance for, for filling out the um, the survey uh, and this ends uh, concludes our I mean, uh, housekeeping. Uh, so today's esteemed speakers are um, Mike uh, Salahou, who is a division manager for the infrastructure partnership 
um, Infrastructure and Partnership Division of the African Development Bank, and is also the Infrastructure Consumption for Africa Coordinator. We'll also have Monsieur, Mr. Jean Kizito Abugaka, uh, who is Division Manager, Transport um, and Logistics, uh, also at the bank. Uh, and last but not least, Mr. Oswald Mulanga Chenda, who is Division Manager of the Water uh, Security and Sanitation um, Division, uh, also uh, from the bank. Uh, I will now hand over to, to Mr. Mike Salawu uh, to guide us through uh, ICA's um, presentation and also, more importantly, the, the report findings. Uh, Mike, uh, if you can hear me, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Arno. Um, pleasant to talk to you again and talk to the esteemed panelists, uh, colleague Zito and Oswald, and as well as all the participants from um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, many uh, uh, corners of the world uh, through this webinar. Indeed, a pleasure uh, for me to briefly share with you uh, the findings, the key findings of the uh, infrastructure financing trend in Africa report by the Social Consortium for Africa uh, following uh, Arno's uh, short presentation. Uh, briefly, uh, the ICA, which uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, is uh, indeed another G8 initiative uh, uh, launched uh, back in July 25 uh, at the Green Eagle Summit, which uh, really uh, 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 aim as a mission to uh, help to increase financing for sustainable infrastructure development in Africa. And of course, uh, as a result, help to improve the lives and economic well-being of African people. So it was really meant to put the infrastructure financing issue back on the agenda. Uh, at the time uh, where you see Africa infrastructure gap uh, be an impediment for its economic uh, takeoff. And that's still the case today, even more so uh, pressing that uh, we have experienced in the past and we'll get into that during the presentation. In terms of value proposition, uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna be very brief on this. Uh, ICA is a, uni a unique platform for major actors in infrastructure space, uh, whether they're policy makers, or infrastructure financing institutions, and also uh, people who really design and build infrastructure. So it's uh, by its uh, membership composition and the network is a, a true consortium for infrastructure uh, issues in Africa. It helps to advocate for critical investment issue in Africa, uh, one of which we'll discuss today through this report. And as you can see from the slide, we have been able to do uh, many activities in support of infrastructure financing, whether it's upstream, meaning uh, the policy issue, the reforms uh, that must be undertaken uh, in order to facilitate and drain more financing infrastructure, capacity building issue, and whether it's on a midstream, this is how do we organize and increase the, the bankability, bankable project available to really attract investment by putting in place what we call a project preparation facility network, whereby ICA play a key role in putting together all these facilities to work together in, with, uh, you know, to achieve this common objective of facilitating investment. And downstream, where we uh, uh, help our members, uh, the MDBs here, I can cite the World Bank, the IFC, the European Commission, the European Investment Bank, of course, the African Development Bank, the Islamic Development Bank, the African Bank, and now very soon also the West African Development Bank, which are all members of ICA to really uh, um, facilitate uh, investment in Africa. So in addition to those banks, I think our members, uh, established members, I would say, include all the G7 countries. So Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, United States, uh, and then um, also uh, the Republic of South Africa. That's the only African member state that we have so far. So it's an opportunity for me to really thank them for their support, continued support to ICA. Without them, this will not have been possible, and we keep uh, looking forward to engage with them. So I will move on to share with you key findings of this uh, 2018 financing uh, infrastructure financing report. Next slide, please. Yeah. So why is this uh, report? Uh, important, particularly for this year. Uh, briefly, the importance of this report should be seen in conjunction with uh, the increasing 
financing trend, a uh, financing gap uh, in Africa. Uh, the African Development Bank has recorded uh, something in the, in, the, in the region of 170 billion as investment gap uh, that we have, of which financing gap is close to 100 billion, uh, all sectors uh, together. So this is uh, a key uh, context, uh, factual that we must always keep in mind, which guide everything that we do, hence the importance of tracking financing as to what extent we are indeed bridging that gap. So this year's report came up with very interesting uh, 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 highlights. It actually helped to, 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 to put light uh, uh, on a key thing that I'll share with you later in the presentation. But next slide. Yeah, okay, next one. Yes, yeah, sure. So in terms of big picture, uh, what is the key uh, uh, message? What happened actually in 2018 in terms of financing? For the first time, uh, we were able to record 100 billion of investment, 100 billion of investment in African infrastructure for the first time. And this is uh, about a 27 or let's say 24% increase compared to 2017 financing uh, in infrastructure in Africa, which uh, you know, is, uh, is a landmark achievement. And, 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 and here, uh, I think we need to uh, really uh, pause on this and then you know, uh, really mark uh, this kind of uh, landmark achievement. 100 billion has never been recorded before. And, 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 and again, if you compare to the last three years average, uh, we are actually added about one third more investment in African investment, in African infrastructure uh, over the last uh, four years. So this is a, indeed a very good achievement. And where is the money coming from? Who are the, you know, institution or, 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 or I mean, financing infrastructure in Africa? First source, which has been consistent, is actually the African government. So African government, once more, have contributed 37.5 billion in terms of investment, meaning about 30, representing about 37.2 percent of total commitment to infrastructure in 2018. This has been consistent for the last past years, where we see African government really stepping up and play their part. And this is followed by China, which is known surprise, uh, about 25.7 billion, which represent 25, one quarter of total commitment to African infrastructure. And I will explain to you later what really uh, uh, trigger uh, this kind of uh, investment from China. And third source that we are uh, able to track down, ICA members, which I briefly uh, highlighted before, ICA members have collectively put about 20.2 billion investment and commitment into African infrastructure represents about 20%, and that is followed by your private sector, which also for the first time has increased their investment beyond 10 billion, about 11.8, and representing 11%. So that gives you a little bit uh, a breakdown of the sources of investment uh, that we were able to track down in 2018. Now, where are this investment going to? meaning which region, and I'll also talk about the sector. In terms of region, we have um, the West African region, which attracted the bulk of this investment, about a quarter of it, uh, meaning 25.6%, followed by North Africa, about roughly 20% of investment went to North Africa, and uh, East Africa, about uh, 15% or so, uh, South Africa, of course, 17%, and then Southern Africa uh, as a general is 13. If you uh, uh, take out South Africa or single out South Africa, it's about 70%. And Central Africa is the least uh, of the region which attracted uh, investment. Now, in terms of sector, which I think is gonna be the focus also of our discussion today, uh, energy sector attracted about uh, 40, 43.8 billion. Uh, which uh, mainly coming from China, which committed about 10 billion more, and followed by ICA government, I mean, ICA members, African government and private sector. So the energy sector is really driven by Chinese investment into energy. Transport sector as number two, wa was able to mobilize about 32.5 billion. And this is in line with the past pattern about investment trend into the sector. So there's no big surprise 
And the third source or destination, sector destination, is water sector. Water sector, and I'm happy that uh, both Kizito and uh, Oswald will be picking up on this. Water sector actually uh, mobilized about 13.3 billion, which is, uh, uh, you know, show about 22% increase compared to last year. And the last one, but not least, is ICT, and which is mostly driven by private sector investment. And here, Will appreciate with me that ICT sector is a very mature sector in terms of investment for, for, for private sector. So very little left for government to do here. Hence, there's very little commitment from the private from the public sector side. Next. Yeah, I've already mentioned where this uh, uh, um, funding or financing uh, coming from. So African government first and then China, of course, the other uh, ICA members, which uh, consistently has been supporting African infrastructure uh, financing. Next. Yeah, uh, I just want to single out the, the, the increasing effort that ICA members have been doing. As I mentioned before, you know, ICA has a purpose. The purpose of ICA is to really mobilize funding to support African infrastructure. So IC members have been doing heavy lifting collectively since inception, and I think that should be singled out. Now, in addition for IC member putting the funding, which is their core uh, 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 support to ICA, they also play a prominent role in leading on the policy reforms agenda and also institutional reform agenda. Throughout uh, more than 10 years of ICA's existence, I see a member have collectively been able to impact and have uh, a real impact on the policy reform agenda uh, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, one of them that I actually can mention is actually the issue of uh, quality infrastructure issue, which I think members of ICA have played a tremendous role in putting out their lot of analytical work that you can find on our website to help the countries to seriously address the issue of quality infrastructure. Yeah, we also meant sustainable infrastructure because we believe that you know we can actually uh, work closely or be closer to bridging the gap infrastructure if we also pay equal attention not only to investment but also also to the issue of quality infrastructure which i think is uh, on the minds of uh, policy makers uh, in africa to come next now critical importance we talk about financing how much were committed this year, I mean, in 2018, where the money went to, and also uh, which sector benefited from the, uh, from the financing. And more importantly, there's still gaps in African infrastructure. So this report really put a, a light on the remaining gap and also tried to, you know, attempted to uh, also put a light on which sector, you know, had the, uh, the critical gap that uh, that uh, that I mean that must be addressed, and that will help us as we uh, trying to you know direct investment to see where do we really channel investment. To. By no surprise, I think overall yearly financing needs, as I mentioned, so about uh, 130 to 170 billion, and then the uh, average commitment uh, per year is about 83 billion, leaving a gap of. Uh, you know, uh, close to 100, uh, I mean, 47 and 87 billion dollars, depending on how you, how to measure it. But sector-wise, water sector remain the least or the, the sector with the most gap. Through the report, we're able to estimate that gap to be between 43 to 53 billion, followed by the energy sector, although there have been increased investment into energy, there's still some gap there, about five to 20 billion in the, in, the, in the energy sector. And then the transport sector as a third one, four, between four to 16 billion. And of course, ICT, as I mentioned, is the one with the least gap, uh, about zero to three billion, meaning that ICT, what is left for ICT to really do is really on private sector side, as the government have invested, you know, in, in putting the, the, the minimum infrastructure required for private sector investment. So that tells us that uh, we still need to do more in energy, I mean, in water sector, energy and transport. So uh, as I mentioned, Kizito and Oswald will tell us how do we 
uh, bridge that gap uh, in those two sectors that they represent here today. Next. And then another key issues and challenges that this report uh, uh, pointed at uh, when we take the, the, the water sector, where I'm, you know, the biggest gap, the key issues for the sector to uh, achieve financial sustainability or to mobilize resources is actually to address the issue of financial sustainability of the public utility. And this, uh, I think Oswald is best place to talk about this issue. Uh, we have a low tariff, which still uh, far away from uh, you know, uh, 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 cost recovery uh, 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 tariff is still impeding uh, uh, financial sustainability of this utility, hence uh, uh, making them uh, the balance is very weak in terms of engaging private sector to, to increase investment. And also, of course, the low level of operational maintenance expenditure also leads to large additional capital expenditure for the water sector. So we need to address not only the issue of tariff to increase revenue stream, and also address the issue of operational maintenance. I'm sure Oswald will, 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 will elaborate on this. The transport sector also one of the two, two key messages emerge from that. Uh, again, the issue of financial viability also remain a big one for the sector, uh, particularly when you talk about rail, you know, the railway sector has been uh, struggling to uh, be viable. Uh, the second message uh, from the report has to do with maintenance as well. We do have road funds uh, uh, for maintenance working well in some countries that uh, still need to be reformed. So some reform ongoing and Kizito uh, here online will also uh, um, have a deep dive on this issue when he uh, speaks to the transport sector. In the power sector, uh, the gap could be eliminated uh, within two or three years, according to our, our estimation, uh, if China keeps commitment level to what we've seen in 2018, and also when others step in. So we can quickly arrive at bridging the gap in energy sector with increased appetite for private sector and the heavy lifting that China is doing in the sector. And again, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, led for discussion to move forward. The ICT, as I mentioned, important public sector role is on the regulation side. So the regulatory environment must ensure competition is there as a broad and equitable access to ICT. Uh, so, so the liberalization of the sector is actually bearing fruit, but we need to maintain regulatory uh, 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 watch and oversight. So my last uh, slide before I meant to before I move to um, other two key points that I wanted to share with you will be on the five key messages. So what are the key messages that this report brought uh, to light? One, African government can save billions of dollars in stronger national planning project selection and feasibility process. Here again, you see that you know uh, it's always the saying that the money is not an issue, but what is an issue is the bankability of the projects that are out there in the market, accessible to investors, that you know will trigger their investment decision. So we need to put more emphasis on project preparation and quality of those project preparation. Second message was good maintenance can free scarce resources for capital investment. This has been uh, mentioned over and over again that maintenance actually helped to bridge the gap for the infrastructure finance. Third message, Increases in both public and private sector funding required to continue to improve economic and social performance. So we still need to do more in both sectors. As the public sector is stepping up, private sector also need to step up. But we know very well to get private sector, certain reforms must be in place to attract uh, private sector to work more together. What message? Increased private sector financing is needed, particularly in water and transport. Sure, my colleagues will address this issue. Last but not least, African national government could move more quickly with decentralization by giving local government more responsibility and more accountability. And again, I would like to point out that uh, it's an area where we think that uh, future report or engagement should also focus on how do we enable and capacitate local government to really have, you know, financing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, opportunities to address the infrastructure issue. Next, and this will be my last slide, then I'll hand over. Quickly, the 2018 infrastructure financing trend also 
put light on two topics, which are not part of the report, but as a separate report. And I'm inviting you to go to the website to check on this report. It's the role of private sector in infrastructure financing, which we find to be very interesting finding there because it pointed out uh, why we are not seeing institutional investors rushing to infrastructure, is that issue of regulation, is issue of financial viability and risk, and so on. So that report actually is very helpful and very enlightening in that respect. The other one is the issue of quality infrastructure investment, which again is a, a, a very recurrent theme today because we discovered that as you put emphasis on more investment, you also need to address this issue of quality infrastructure and having a, a life cycle approach to infrastructure planning. And of course, since we are all working within the G20 quality infrastructure investment principle, this is something that uh, we also want to see uh, going forward. And ICS stand ready to promote and help African government to mainstream this kind of principle in the investment plan. Uh, I know that completes my presentation and uh, before I ask the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for sharing the report findings. If you can just unmute, unmute yourself um, for uh, the moment being. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. So, so thank you very much for, for sharing the, the report findings. This is quite uh, enlightening. Um, we are now going to deep dive into two specific sectors, uh, both extremely important for, for the continent. Um, and first, let's turn to, to Mr. Oswald Shanda uh, on uh, water. Uh, on the water sector challenges. So as I mentioned in the transition, Oswald is the division manager uh, of uh, the water security and sanitation um, division uh, of the African Development Bank. Uh, Oswald, if you can hear me, you can unmute yourself and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I know, thank you very much. Sword, uh, I think we have an issue with the line. Uh, we can't hear you now. Uh, can you perhaps try to mute and unmute yourself? All right. Okay, is that okay? That that's working now. I think there, there might be a connection issue. Um, try to unmute and mute yourself again. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I guess I need to speak a little more slowly. I think I think we have uh, yeah I think there is an issue either with the microphone or the or the connection as well. Um, sometimes happen with the internet connectivity. Um, that's uh, the... So so also it seems that there there is an issue. What we can do is um, just um, we'll take care of the technical issues. Uh, I would suggest we just give the floor to 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 Jean. Uh, the time uh, just the time for us to to solve this this technical issue. Would that be fine? Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, okay, perfect. So 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 so. Uh, well, um, thank you. Um, so we we'll, I will now hand over the. The floor to, to, to Mr. Kabongukam to, to, to get us through the transport sector challenges. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Arno. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like first to actually to thank the organizer for associating me in this webinar session on infrastructure financing trends in Africa. This is a timely discussion. Uh, now, as uh, Mike stated in his intervention, uh, by the way, actually, I think uh, Mike, uh, thank you, Mike, for what you put across in your presentation. Though I'm not sure that I will respond to all the issues you pass over to me, uh, but uh, I'll try. 
And then I, I was saying that this is Mike stated in his presentation, Africa need massive investment in infrastructure. We say overall, overall yearly financing need is uh, between 130 to 170 billion. However, in recent year, we noticed, we noticed that the continent have reached the turning point in public sector infrastructure funding. It is therefore time to us, actually, to all of us, actually, and then particular for our country, our government, to take an aggressive look at alternative source of infrastructure financing in Africa. And if uh, looking the transport sector perspective, the idea is to attract the private sector, either in PPP or in private sector transaction, and to see how to leverage the various the various dormant funds that are pension fund and other sovereign funds. I think uh, recently we are trying really to to look for some alternative uh, way of funding our infrastructure, particularly in transport. And then uh, for some of the projects, actually there is a, a there is an appetite actually for the private sector to chip in. Uh, now, in addition to that, I think it's really very important for the continent to take advantage of, uh, of the grid, that grid potential by putting in place two key, uh, two key measures, actually. First of all, it's effective institutional arrangements to manage, to manage the complex takeover project planning. I think most of the time when we are working on infrastructure development, there is a problem of uh, executive agency i think this is uh, this is one of the key issue countries should actually put in place secondly i think it's to focus on the soft side of infrastructure development on tackling the big policy and the regulatory issues i think for me that it's the the big picture i think for transport we have uh, the gap it's something like uh, 35 to 50 billion dollar per billion dollar per year and then uh, I think uh, from that point, I would like to bring to, to you two key messages. And, oh, and then uh, I think that will bring a probably thing that can help us really to have a more pro productive discussion. The first message, it's, uh, it's, it's about pension fund. Insurance investors such as insurance company, pension fund and sovereign wealth fund have more than 100 trillion in assets under management globally. From that, we strongly believe that a small fraction of the excess global savings and uh, resources will be enough to plug Africa's financing gap and financing productive in profitable infrastructure. I think that it's really very important. The second, the second one is uh, Africa don't, do not need to solve all their infrastructure problem before they can achieve sustain and increase growth. Instead, they should focus on how to best use their discuss infrastructure budgets to achieve the highest economic and social return. I think uh, particularly on this one, I think we need to agree that universal access to high quality infrastructure can only be a long-term goal. When we are talking about uh, Funding, actually, I think it's really very important to keep that in mind. I think we need to try really to achieve what the, 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 the infrastructure gap with limited resource, resources, and then that led to government spend too much on too many projects with low income. This that means beyond spending more, Africa government must spend better. Uh, now, I think I don't know if there is need to go in detail by, by, by sector and subsector, because there is uh, the picture actually in transport, it's really very, very uh, complex. For instance, for sector, actually, I would like to share with you the our experience in, uh, for instance, in aviation sector, where, for instance, the bank think that the private, the private sector should be the one leading, actually, the development of that, uh, that subsector. While for the rail one, railways and uh, uh, road, Will remain actually under the, the push of the public sector. 
Port has, is a very big gig actually for infrastructure development because there is already private sector actually who are really instrumental in the port development infrastructure. And this is why for, for, for me, I would like to, to discuss the last topic is about a regional uh, project. I think uh, under, the, under this uh, African trade, uh, uh, African free trade area, I think we receive a lot of actually push for the, con the continent to develop actually comprehensive uh, regional project, uh, regional uh, infrastructure project. I think uh, that there is a need really to invest massively actually on that regional uh, regional project and uh, probably I think uh, I would like to bring that to the attention of the participants. We have more discussion. I know that there will be some question about uh, why the regional project is not uh, is not successful in the continent. Why we can put in in infrastructure in place and then uh, the, the traffic is not uh, is not the flow of traffic is not uh, there is a problem on that one. I think I don't know, Mike. If uh, I don't respond to all your question, actually you pass over to me. But uh, this is the key, the three key messages I would like to share with the participants. Thank you, Arno. Thank you very much for the very clear messages, um, Mike. I can see you are mute. You want to react to that? Yeah, no, I think uh, you know, um, easy to put a, a lot of emphasis on the on the on the key issue, really. Uh, you know, uh, this 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 issue of uh, turning point. I think I fully agree. The government have have delivered their 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 burden share, and I think now what we are trying to do more of is uh, get private sector to 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 enter, and one of the avenues is uh, through a PPP, where we are solving. Uh, the more complex one of uh, institutional investors, as you mentioned, and also pension funds, uh, which has a tremendous asset on the, on the management. But, uh, you know, I, I, and I know on that front, uh, the recent uh, MDB's uh, 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 report that uh, the bank has, uh, has led, uh, because the president of this bank was uh, recent time, I mean, until last month, I would say, uh, the, 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 the head of uh, uh, the, 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 the MDB's uh, head uh, uh, um, uh, network. So that report is very is very telling. I think we should share that report uh, with the, the people. Uh, we can find that on the ICA website, on the bank website as well, which really put uh, emphasis in the same direction that we should do more to uh, incentivize uh, um, uh, institutional investors to put a lot of focus on infrastructure. And one way of doing that is through regulation. The other one is also through uh, the de-risking instrument that uh, the bank and other MDB uh, have in their um, in their toolkits uh, to really uh, uh, leverage and manage the risk aspect, which I think is a, a key impediment for institutional investors moving to African infrastructure. So, how do we help them to de-risk uh, this uh, uh, this their investment through the use of uh, you know, a uh, partial risk guarantee and, uh, uh, and then the other uh, type of guarantee that the bank had. Uh, and, and, and I think that's something that we should collectively work on. Of course, the issue of project preparation is also there. How do we prepare a project that is attractive enough for private sector? So I think as we move on uh, with this webinar, uh, we will have more uh, to say about uh, how do we get institutional investors mm -hmm. to be involved, uh, in, uh, in public uh, infrastructure. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike. That's uh, that's a fundamental aspect, indeed. Uh, Jean, you want to react to that? Yes, I totally agree with uh, Mike. Actually, or not, just mention. I think uh, we need really to deepen actually the discussion about uh, all the soft the soft issues. Actually, most of the the continent have to know that that is one of the key. I think. Uh, we can have infrastructure in place, uh, but without actually proper institutional framework, etc. I think we cannot really achieve the actually the end result of that infrastructure in place. I think that it's one of the key. The second one is actually institutional framework as well as for regional as national. Uh, would you suppose really to take the lead in terms of uh, implementing actually regional and national project? Actually, also that it's one. Some of the things actually are missing when people are talking about financing, funding the infrastructure in the continent. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Jean. I would like now to give the opportunity to, to us her to, to guide us through the challenges uh, on the water sanitation um, sector. Osward, if you can unmute yourself and give it another try. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Good. I think the technical issues are not uh, have not been resolved. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the connection, so there is not much we can do. Um, also, I'm, I'm I'm really sorry. Um, I I think we have to 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 skip that part and perhaps uh, have you uh, involved in the in the in the in the Q and A. Uh, so so I can suggest that we start um, uh, the Q and A now. Uh, that we open uh, the questions. Uh, question to, to the floor. Uh, so as I said, you can ask the question either via the, 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 the chat um, chat icon uh, or the Q&A one, or just raise your hand and we will give you the, the mic. Um, so um, I don't see any questions for now. Um, so I might have one myself. Um, one to Jean. Um, so Jean, can you tell us about uh, physical and non-physical barriers to to the development of uh, interstate transportation in, in Africa? Okay, thank you, Amo. Uh, I guess that uh, actually your question refer really to the the Africa Regional Transport Corridor, I think, uh, because it's, uh, if you talk about interstate, actually, I think it's about corridor, actually, or um, international road. Uh, first of all, I think the physical barrier here refers to uh, mostly to the infrastructure, actually, the quality of the infrastructure. That if, uh, if the design is poor, if the maintenance is poor, if there is some absence of certain uh, facilities, I think then we can talk about uh, physical barrier. While non-physical barrier, it's really linked to the administrative procedure, transit procedure, custom checkpoint, police checkpoints, way bridges, etc. I think those are really obstacle for international transport. And uh, I know that in the continent, we have uh, almost more or less 20 corridors, major corridors. And then uh, one of the key issues of, uh, of, uh, of the transport on the, on the, the, the uh, first of all, probably I think it's really very important to say what is, what means a transport corridor. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a transport system. It's defined one or more of mode of transportation along a particular road actually coming from the sea for the time being actually we actually ports are really the, the the beginning of a corridor or the end of the corridor on the other way i think now most of the corridors most of the uh, the agency or authority handling corridors have a problem by to implement actually the transport and trade facilitation instruments along those corridors this is why they are really facing a big problem. And then uh, that impact, of course, the, the high transportation cost of all our corridors in Africa. For me, I think uh, there is just one, one solution for that one. It's uh, the Q and it's uh, the political will. I think uh, uh, we see that for some region when up to the head of state are involved actually in looking how goods are moving along the corridor, I think there is a change. Otherwise, for the other region, actually, I think uh, a corridor can remain actually under the, 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 the police or the custom checkpoint, etc. are really the big boss of the corridor. And then we can for, have for 1,200 kilometers, the track can spend something like 20 days. I think, I don't know if I respond to your question, but actually, I think that's the issue of uh, uh, physical or non-physical barrier along uh, uh, interstate uh, transport in Africa. Um, yes, that was very clear, John. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. 
so we have a couple of questions from from the audience. Um, so the first one um, is being related to yeah. Um, let me state the first question. So apart from government finances, um, are domestic finances growing in, in contributions? So that that's that's uh, more directed to you, Mike. Um, uh, they would help. Um, they would help forex risk as well as strengthen the local private sector. So yeah. Mike, if you want to react to that. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And I think, um, yes, uh, domestic resources mobilization, uh, as we mentioned, has to do with uh, government uh, mobilizing uh, fiscal resources to, uh, to fund uh, their own infrastructure uh, through different means, uh, either by tax, uh, tax revenues and also uh, issuing uh, Bonds, uh, it could be uh, infrastructure bonds and, and and so on. I, I think we are we are actually uh, seeing, as we mentioned, you know, as as the report pointed out, an increase uh, 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 an increased investment from African government. They are actually leading the way, but that does not mean that the issue of domestic resource mobilization uh, is resolved. Uh, I, I I I would like to say that it's actually uh, one of the uh, solution to actually bridge the gap. Because uh, uh, we know very well that uh, you know uh, uh, mobilizing resources that are outside of uh, uh, the government uh, uh, control is actually subject to a lot of uh, uh, critical texts. You know, we talk about issue of uh, 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 reassuring institutional investors, and then private sector want to see specific uh, uh, um, bankability issues or commercial viability issues. So. The more we focus on uh, internal or domestic resource mobilization, uh, the better. Uh, one way is also to address uh, this issue of uh, illicit financial flows that also we know very well. It's no secret to anyone. It's actually a huge uh, issue here in Africa that we try to address and channel those resources uh, through government and uh, to, for infrastructure financing. So domestic resource mobilization, yes, is actually uh, the way to go is actually one of the solutions for us to, to bridge this infrastructure gap. And uh, uh, of course, linked to that is the whole issue of local uh, currency financing infrastructure, which is also an issue in terms of uh, mobilizing uh, uh, downstream financing for, for, for African uh, infrastructure. So we will, I think one of the areas where this report uh, will uh, will try to address as we move forward, how do we increase domestic resource mobilization? Fund African infrastructure. All right. Th thanks, Mike. Uh, Jean. Okay, no, Jean, Jean, you just mute yourself. Um, uh, Mike, another question. Uh, this time li linked to to the financing from from pension funds. Um, so, can public infrastructure projects uh, be de risk enough during development uh, to attract pension funds? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's one area where uh, the bank is uh, has been uh, has been very actively uh, uh, working. Uh, as you know, we we have a lot of uh, de-risking and guarantee instrument uh, that we uh, put uh, to reassure and uh, make investment easier for institutional investors uh, who uh, have uh, a lot of concern about uh, the risk. Uh, you know, uh, the risk. Uh, Aspect to their, their investment because of the nature of their their business, they are actually very low risk, uh, and, and then have uh, also uh, a long term view. So someone needs to de-risk this project. The bank has a series of tools that we use, uh, whether it's upstream, in terms of uh, you know making this project bankable, uh, meaning how do we prepare, develop this project upfront to address the issue of uh, you know uh, environmental risk here. Uh, economic risk, uh, technical risk, uh, and, and also the the, uh, the issue of uh, of uh, financial viability. So we do have a series of instruments. One of them is, of course, uh, project preparation facilities that the bank uh, holds. One of them is Nepal IPPF, which really focuses on regional project infrastructure to help countries to prepare projects. We believe that's the first step of de risking because the better quality for their preparation is the more the easier it is to mobilize downstream financing so that's where it's difficult to mobilize funding 
uh, and that's where institutional investors is actually, uh, you know, very far away from from that space. So some money to do that, and we are able with the instrument we have at the bank, we have to bring some funds to step in and take that risk, first risk, which is uh, very important to test the the bank ability of this project. When that is done, we now have to go for structuring uh, and structure this project. So one way of bringing institutional investors in upfront is to bring them along throughout the project life cycle. So what do I mean by that? Once we are doing project development, we need to start talking to them to know their requirement. What do they care about? What do they want to see in this project for them to step in at the end of the day? So once we know their requirement much better, then we can tailor and structure the projects accordingly as we move along uh, the project preparation phases. So phase two, which is uh, really structuring the project to uh, address the issue of uh, uh, bankability, commercial viability issues, uh, you know, the internal rate of return that is really adequate for a pension fund to step in. There also, we need to do this partnership with, uh, uh, with this fund. And then by the time we finish with structuring phase, moving to financial close and so on, then we are ready that uh, we are actually sure that we will have met uh, the requirement for institutional investors. And again, as we de-risk this project with the instrument of, uh, you know, there the bank can put guarantee instrument. I mentioned partial risk guarantee. We also have partial credit uh, credit guarantee, PCG and PRG. And we have a host of other other instruments that we've been using to actually um, reassure institutional investors that this is a bankable project. They can comfortably put their money in there. But that is still not enough to attract a lot of institutional investors unless regulation also step in. So the regulation, meaning the country uh, with the pension fund are very cautious, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, how the percentage allocation they can have to infrastructure fund outside of their jurisdiction. So that's where we are uh, working on now to see how we can, you know, to the policy dialogue with the countries to see how they can actually enable the environment for institutional investors to invest in infrastructure once the project has been de-risked. And the issue of regulation also should be removed or addressed in a way that they give enough comfort to institutional investors. And I will again refer to the to the study that the bank has done with other MDBs, which is on our website. We come up with an innovative way that uh, we can uh, we can uh, uh, um, help to mobilize institutional investors. Uh, it's an easy task because this is a fairly regulated uh, uh, institution, but we believe that there are innovative ways that uh, can actually be tested uh, with the arsenal of uh, tools that MDBs have to, 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 to really make uh, this happen. But the IC report, once more, have touched on this particular issue. It went far even to look at sector by sector. You know, we tend to put infrastructure all together. Yes, that's true. But if you go sector by sector, energy, water, transport, ICT, the requirements are different. There are some sectors that lend themselves very easily to uh, institutional investors' investment. They are fairly tested. Energy and transport is one of them. I mean, uh, actually, the two. Once you move to water sector, it becomes very complicated. And as we mentioned, ICT, uh, the opportunities are very low for institutional investors because private sector is actually taking lead. So the, the task for us now is to see how do we further Know, understand the requirement for water sector to be able to attract more institutional investors. In the transport sector, Kizito is there. We mentioned what you know uh, uh, been done recently by the bank in terms of projects where we can see increasing appetite for institutional investors. Energy is well known for the IPPs and so on, and other other uh, private investors. So yes, uh, we have instruments in the bank to work on upstream work, downstream and also midstream, but it's not enough unless we have the regulation also to follow. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mike. Uh, so, uh, fostering extra investment is, is indeed a uh, priority uh, for, for, for the bank. Um, you start to, to, to talk about uh, water. We do have a question that, and I mean, I'm looking at the time, we'll take um, just two last questions to stick to, to, to schedules. Um, so we have a question from Daniel Lemu. Um, 
mentioning that you highlighted uh, the wide gap in financing the, the water infrastructure and would like to know uh, what is uh, the possible recommendation to lessen this gap uh, as the issue is of greater concern to for all African countries. Okay. Um, Michael Oswald, if you can Oswald, if you can jump in, perhaps let's give it a last try. Right. So, so Mike, you you can go you can go ahead. Hello. Okay. Oswald. You can get me now. Yes. Right now we can hear you. Oh. And we just lost you again. <laughs> We, we are not lucky today. So very much, very, very sorry about that. Uh, also, um, so 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 Mike, could you could you react to that uh, question? Well, it's difficult for me to step in the uh, Oswald shoes here, but uh, I think I mean uh, again based on our our report, uh, what we found as uh, as a way uh, by which we can uh, increase uh, private sector participation. Uh, in uh, water is really to address the issue of financial sustainability. You know, for long, water sector has been perceived as being a social sector, uh, yet uh, we've seen uh, private sector investment in other regions in Africa. For instance, uh, if you look at Morocco, which has really opened up uh, the water sector to attract a lot of private sector investment, particularly on the distribution side. And I think, uh, uh, you know, we need to learn from, from that and see how you know the good regulation and then the, uh, the good policy set up policy set of governor can actually allow more of uh, water uh, investment uh, again ICA uh, has been very instrumental uh, you know in in, uh, in uh, paving the way for private sector investment into water back in uh, I guess in 20, 2014 and 15 uh, I think uh, one of the ICA members uh, I think KFW uh, has uh, has led the way by uh, you know uh, working with the Global Water Partnership, which uh, uh, um, has done diagnostic work to really understand why private sector are not moving as fast enough into water sector. So that work, uh, which again reports are available to the website of ICA, uh, um, really you know pointed out a few things. Uh, one of them. Uh, as we mentioned here again, is the issue of financial sustainability. The second is also regulation issue. You know, how is the sector organized? Because a sector that's liberalized, particularly the distribution side, is likely to attract you know, private sector if you address the issue of tariff. The issue of tariff, again, is at the center of the financial sustainability of liability for the sector. The second one is also to change the mindset and start Putting water as a, you know, uh, can that can have commercial angle to it because it's a, it's a, it's a utility that's like energy, water as well. Uh, that can be commercially viable if the sector governance issues uh, are there. So through that work of ICA, we have uh, uh, trying to uh, you know uh, make some recommendations for African government and institutions, particularly the river basin institution. How should, should the structure of water project to be able to attract private sector investment? We also have supported, uh, you know, water bulk water transfer projects. I think it was in Rwanda uh, that also attracted a lot of private sector interest. That is again a demonstration of when the public and private sector uh, you know, come together in the context of a good sector governance, they can actually attract private sector. Currently, we are working with. Uh, uh, Lesotho and, uh, and Botswana uh, on the water transfer from Lesotho through South Africa to Botswana, where we are already at the preparation phase, trying to address the bottleneck that will prevent private sector from investing in the uh, in water sector. And again, we are doing this with uh, uh, fairly reputable uh, uh, institutions that have a lot of uh, knowledge in, uh, in the institutional reform for water sector to help de-risk this project private sector coming to, to the table. But uh, as I said, Oswald is more, is better place to, to talk about this issue than myself, but because of uh, that he's not able to, to, to step in, I share with you very high level, broad, broad uh, views about how what the sector is, uh, is doing uh, to do this. 
and and also reforms is very important in this context. I mean, uh, you know, certain governance has to do with reforms. You you need to do the right reforms uh, to 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 really open up the sector and make it visible enough to private sector to see opportunities, uh, uh, whether it's on the on the distribution side and also on the transportation side, where we can see uh, you know. Interesting. And I will defer to Oswald if he's connected. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, he's, connect, he's connected, but it seems we we are having a hard time to 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 hear him yeah. after Oswald. Let's give him a last very last try. Oh, yeah, no, there seems to be to be a major issue with the with the connection. Very, very sorry about that, uh, Osred, and that's very unfortunate that you cannot react on this uh, extremely important um, topic. Um, looking at my uh, at my watch, I think we've reached uh, we've reached uh, the end of the of the, the session. Uh, I think I mean we, we got quite a lot of of questions on the chat and and the Q and A. I think most of them have been addressed um, by by uh, Mike and uh, and Jean. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, before we wrap up this webinar, um, I would have a, a last question for you, Mike, and more related to, to, the, to the report. Um, can you tell us what we can expect uh, in the next uh, edition of the ICA report? And is there any pressing issue the current report has underneath or that need to be discussed further? Yeah, indeed. I think, uh, you know, as, uh, as we are trying to dive into this issue of uh, financing trend, there are um, a key thematic area that, uh, that are coming uh, more often uh, to the table. In the last uh, November, when we launched this study in South Africa, uh, the issue of uh, uh, you know, uh, private sector uh, is, is, uh, is really uh, coming up. And there we, 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 we saw some interesting uh, um, um, area uh, of uh, kind of innovation uh, that we can have one of them is uh, Caisse de Depot, uh, uh, which we are seeing more and more of uh, on the continent. I think uh, countries have really tested these uh, uh, models of France and Canada, uh, and, and also a few other, I think Italy also, where this Caisse de Depot has really served as a uh, channel between uh, public and private sector, uh, mobilizing resources uh, to fund infrastructure. Uh, as more African countries are really putting in place the depot, we think it's an area for us to, 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 to look into as innovative way of financing infrastructure. The other one also is the instrument. We also want to look at what type of instrument uh, uh, are, are being used to fund infrastructure and which one should we try uh, to increase the usage of to make infrastructure financing uh, uh, feasible. We just talked about institutional investors. What kind of instrument uh, uh, do they use, or do they need to seek for, their, for them to uh, invest uh, their money? So we have to look at uh, the, this innovative range of instrument and actors. You mentioned Kesley Depot, institutional investor, of course, is one of them. We want to zoom in on those aspects uh, uh, as we move. Uh, so you can expect to see more of uh, uh, the, the financing, innovative financing tools and, and instruments. Uh, that we can put on the uh, on the table in the uh, next report, and the the other issue also we we, we want to dive into in the next report will be uh, on the, on regional project. Uh, as you know, there's PIDA PIDA Part Two, uh, which is uh, again uh, under preparation and will be approved by the AU Heads of State Summit uh, January 21, which is going to you know, look at priority project. So how do we prepare to fund PIDA project? And I think uh, that's also going to be an area where we look at regional projects. You know, what are the impediments that uh, make regional project financing uh, very important? And lastly, uh, the issue of uh, municipal, I mean, let's say urban infrastructure financing. It's also an emerging team uh, that uh, we can also try to look. So there will be a, a host of uh, areas that we can explore in the next report. But those three really are on the top of the agenda. Of course, Members, I see members will also give us what they think should be focus area for the next report. Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a beautiful yeah, that's conclusion, it. Mike. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Oswald and John. Um, 
Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar uh, on infrastructure financing trends in Africa. Uh, so the report, uh, ICA report is, is available on ICA website, uh, icaafrica.org, uh, um, and as well on our website on, on making finance work for Africa web website, so mfw4a.org. Um, so feel free to, to, to get your, your free digital copy, and this is really a very comprehensive uh, work. Uh, if you have any other question, please uh, contact us via via our website. I will be most happy to to, to answer. Um, as I mentioned in introductions, uh, once the, the webinar will end, you will see a survey popping up on your browser. So we would very much appreciate if you could could take a um, very brief uh, time to to complete the survey and, and provide your your feedback. And, and please don't mention my my, my French accent as as you could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm francophone. <laughs> so, you, you will receive a, a very well. I know very well. It <laughs> is a perfect. Is perfect bilingual. Next yeah. time, we'll have a, this webinar in French. Why not? <laughs> yeah, that would be also adapted. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much to our panelists. Um, you will receive a, a follow-up email within uh, the next uh, two days uh, with a link to view. Uh, recording of, of today's webinar. So with that, again, thank you very much, everybody. And um, we do hope um, to see you soon in our next uh, webinars. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnaud. And thanks thank uh, to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.